Hey everybody, John Gucci Foley here today. I'm super excited because I have a dear close friend, one of the best educators, authors, and speakers in the world, Lair Torrent. Hey Lair, I know your background, not only in psychology, but this idea of how people connect, how we get the best out of individuals. You've been on NPR, Rolling Stones. We got the New York Times, but most importantly, Importantly, uh, you work with me and together we right. go out there and we work with uh, companies on how to bring high performance and really activate it. But uh, welcome to the show and glad you're here. Thanks so much for having me, John. I'm excited. But I'm really excited to join you and uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm really excited for this conversation. Yeah, we've got so many things to dive into. Uh, I also have a very quick video that I want to share with everybody who's watching this, gives you a little context. And then Lara and I are going to dig deep into not only what works on the Blue Angels, but why it works. And most importantly, how you can activate this in your life. Let's roll the video. If you want enhanced performance, if you want to do better at anything in life, I don't care what it is. It's knowing who in you shows up. If the kid from and me from the wrong side of the tracks shows up to this thing, this interview is gonna go a particular way. If the wounded child in me or the inner fraud in me shows up, this interview is probably not gonna go very well. Who do I wanna be? Two weeks, two months, two years from now. How do I wanna be able to talk about this event in my life? Lair, that's very powerful. You asked a couple of really powerful questions on who do you wanna be and how do I wanna show up? Why are those questions so powerful? Well, Jen, you know, it was news to me when I first come, came to the understanding that I am not the single organism I see staring back at me in the mirror, that I am the many vestiges of myself. Depending on the people, the places, the things that I come in contact with, it means different aspects in me. On the, I get used word now, we get triggered and different parts of me will come up. And so I learned very early on that success in every area of my wasn't necessarily always dependent upon more practice or more reps. Those are important, but it was actually how I was going to show up in the moment in those in those moments of my life that are most important to me. That how I should the part of me that showed up that was going to be the tail of the tape. And I noticed that in every area of psychology, we have some version of parts going all the way back to Freud's id, ego, superego. Carl Jung talked about the complexes. He talked about how compartmentalized we are in the human. And so what I did is I started looking into that and how can we use that for top performance in our professional lives, in our relationships? Yeah. Yeah, well, I love, I mean, I, I think about on the Blue Angels, I know you just saw the film, so I want to dive into that. But I think about yeah. how I knew how it worked on the Blues. And after talking to you and working with you for so long, we start to understand why it works, right? What is going on in these these minds of ours and our bodies that mm -hmm. are, um, are actually either inhibiting our performance, our teamwork, our trust, or our relationships, or enhancing that. And I think, you know, one thing that was really clear to me is um, it, you knew who you were on the Blue Angels. You were an ambassador of goodwill, okay? Mm -hmm. That was the greater purpose higher than oneself. And then how did you fit into that? But also it was about the we, not the I, but you had to have your I. You had to understand your I. So tell me about how this idea of parts and knowing yep. clearly who you are relates to work relationships, those kinds of things. Well, when I'm doing my talks with companies, I will give them a visceral experience of parts work right out the gate. I'll say this, there is a part of you here that is ideally your work self. This is the version of you sitting at your desk or doing whatever it is that you do that is the side of you that shows up to work. And I will say, if I, as a psychotherapist, show up, let's say, in my wife as the psychotherapist or speaker that I am, she will very often ask me if she's paying for that hour, yeah. right? Denoting How's that yeah, go, you know, by the way? It doesn't go very well, right? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm sure. Because, right, because she's denoting that like there's a side of my husband here that is not just my husband or the father of my children. It's this professional that speaks in the manner that I do as a professional and has the insights that I have as a professional. It doesn't quite work there as well as it does say in my office or when I'm on stage. And so it's news to most people that we get to choose how we show up, like much the way we choose the suit clothes for the day, right? And the idea is you don't want to, you know, wear your gym clothes to the prom. 
And, you know, one of the things that was interesting about parts that I saw kind of in the movie as an example, and you can see it kind of happening. You looked at a guy like Boss. He'd been around for a very long time. It was actually last season, I think, when filming that. He's very sure of himself and who he is and how he shows up and the part of him does. And then you looked at Cheese, right? And and Cheese talked about He's feeling the fraud. Four, remember, he right. was the training officer. But keep going. I'm glad that you've got the the nicknames down. Call signs. Yeah. So right. And so I, I love the call signs, by the way. And so Cheese talked about like, is this? He's like, you know, and this is a guy who's already done very, very well as a pilot, as a naval aviator, out in the, uh, you know, in, in the fleet. And so he's not new to the game. But the part of him that was coming up is the inner fraud, it's something we need to talk about in every area of work, right? Like if you need to show up, if you need to do something that is out of your comfort zone, something that's hard, something that needs your best, we've got to know who in you. It's got to be the version of you that has access to all the skills that you need to pull that off. And if you don't, then it's like it's like showing up to Instagram and trying to send an email. It just doesn't work. You're in the wrong app. Yeah, let's let's talk about that authentic self in a work environment because sometimes it's hard, right? Sometimes people mm -hmm. don't want to show up as their authentic self because they may be afraid. Fear may may be entering the equation. Um, but you noticed on the Blue Angels, not just in that film, but you know, in, in all the teachings that we've done together and with companies, is you got to show up as your authentic self. That's what glad to be here really means. I, I am, um, I'm authentic, I'm grateful, and, and I'm going to show up to the best I can be, but it might not be great that day. So, so talk to me more about how does someone show up with their authentic self? So for me, authenticity is bred through integrity, congruence, and alignment, right? I see people who fire really, really well in every area of their life when they're working in that authentic self. And when I talk about authenticity, people know what the word means typically. But they're like, you know, how do I know I'm there? How do I get there? And authenticity for me is bred again on walking in integrity with congruency and alignment. That means like doing the things that you're that you 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 say you're going to do. And as a leader, as like as a therapist, right? I don't ask clients to walk a path that I'm unwilling to walk myself, right? I don't ask people to get up early and to read the things that they write in their journal, meditate, exercise, do all the things that are right for their body, and their brain, and then not do it myself. They would know. And my practice would fall apart because they knew that I'm not walking in integrity. I'm not showing up in authenticity. And the thing that I see that plagues a lot of companies is inauthenticity, not walking in integrity, not walking in congruence. And so I'll go into companies and the first thing I'll do is I'll look at the front page of their website. And typically you'll see, you know, like the, the five pillars of success and the, the path to wherever it is they're going. And they're, 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 they're talking about this ethos that they have. But when I talk to the employees, perhaps it's not going to scale. And so this is where we find it, it at the top. We have to, we have to show up. Uh, the leaders in every company have to show up in authenticity to walk their walk they have to talk their talk well that's uh, that dives into me we need a tool we need a way to help people to feel safe to show up in their themselves i'm thinking about the debrief right so um you've seen me talk about the glad to be here debrief why that is such a unique and special way to build mm -hmm. some of this and by the way i love your uh integrity uh, what uh, congruence and then alignment. alignment. I, love, mm -hmm. I love that. You know, yeah. it's also in the connect the line commit fits right in that too. Right. Yeah. But talk to me about why, you know, you've been part of the debrief, you teach the debrief. Yeah. Why is that so unique in how we teach it versus let's say what most people would call an after action review. Something yeah. Like the that. first I heard you speak, I had a question about the debrief because you, you, you stopped the debriefing video and 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 you're like what do you see and yeah you give it out to the crowd and this the first thing i saw is that the boss the head guy was the first person to step up and say this is this is what i need to work on this is my safety as you guys call it right this is the thing that i need to work on and that's so hard to do right and and so you'll you'll hear you'll hear about companies that say you know mistakes are opportunities for learning and if you talk to the you talk to the employees 
you know, they'll go, I don't know. I mean, I heard that, but it's not necessarily something that we carry to scale. And so what I saw with the blues is this, this creation of safety. It's safe to talk about um, the places that you need to work on. And that breeds authenticity, that breeds alignment, that breeds integrity. And, you know, when I was first coming up as a therapist, we did something similar. It was mm -hmm. called group supervision. And so they bring a bunch of us together because you need to be supervised. You got to keep you. So you do case presentations to a, a therapist who's your supervisor. So you're there in front of everybody, similar to the debrief, right? And so you get called out on that, called out on the carpet, but you bring a case to the, to the table. Well, the thing I saw everybody doing was bringing their best stuff which is not what the blues do in the, in the debrief, right? And everybody, including me, I was bringing like, yes, and then I, pearls of wisdom came from my mouth and I said the thing that saved all. And you know what I was doing, John? I was not learning. I didn't feel safe. I didn't, I wasn't authentic. I wasn't in alignment because I knew I was a new therapist. I couldn't be good at this thing. And so I, one day I finally got tired of myself and listening to everything that was going on that just felt inauthentic. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to show up with my growing edge. I'm going to show up in that place where I need help. I'm going to be truthful. I'm going to be authentic for myself and for my clients. Right. Yeah. And so I, I started talking about the thing I wasn't doing well. And you, you could have heard a pin drop, right? Like, what is he doing? Is he crazy? And immediately like the, the supervisor dialed in and I learned so much more because I was so willing to talk about the thing that I was struggling with that growing edge that I needed help with. And consequently, when I left that practice, you know, and I don't mean to, 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 to be boastful, but it's like my practice blew up first. My book deal happened first, M becoming a, becoming a speaker. All of that happened first. And I think it had everything to do with showing up in that, that room in integrity, just like the blues did. Well, I love that example. And, you know, it, it is hard, right? That's the one thing I've noticed having taught this now for two decades and getting companies mm -hmm. that actually adopt this is most people are just not used to putting their their safety yep. or their um, what they could do better on the table. And instead, it's just the opposite. You have that withhold, right? So um, everybody knows it, but no one's willing to say it, that elephant in the room, or you're withholding information. Um, what what was the way that the, the Blue Angels, and we teach the Glad to Be Here debrief, what we did is we tried to create a safe environment first. That's called, you know, there's the five dynamics, right? And the first mm -hmm. is this safe environment, which I like to say starts with respect, right? Respect yeah. of, of, of everybody. But what else does a company or, or a team or an individual need to do to create a safe environment? You know, we can look at the sort of, if we, if we call the company, the macro relationship and, uh, and maybe like, a relationship with your kid or with your partner micro relationship what makes the space between two people the safest it's personal responsibility ah. right yeah when you know that the person next to you is going to own their stuff when you know that you don't have to point the finger and and that's the thing in the with the blues and the debrief right no one has to point a finger because i'm pointing at myself and if you look at the dynamic between two people again be you and your kid could be you and your partner, you and a friend. When someone is willing to own where they might have misstepped, own where they've made a mistake, own where they could do better, immediately the space between them safe. And so, you know, the place I thought of the most with regard to the blues is the 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 formation behind you, where you guys are flying so close, like wing to wing. How close are those wings? Like 12 inches, 18 inches, something ridiculous like that. Yeah, well, in this picture, it's early on in the season. It's probably more like uh I'd say 36, but we get to 18. Oh, 36, 36. Yeah, I know. Well, that's a big, that's, yeah. <laughs> and then you saw that's 36. Yeah. You know, that, that's a, that's closer. <laughs> we eventually get close enough to where like you're touching your monitor here, that, that 12 inches, you know, the Yankee set. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Now. So how do you get there? Well, yeah. So it's beautiful. What I love the, how the, it's the practice, but it's first, you got to set what we're talking about here. And that's is what I experienced in my first uh, blue angel debrief, which by the way, I'd done thousands of tactical debriefs in the mm -hmm. military, fighter pilots, top gun, these kinds of things. And those are all good. Okay. Mm -hmm. But they're not what we're talking about. They, this right. is something unique here. And when I would, got to experience that, firsthand as a as an applicant, I had just gotten selected, we call it a newbie, I was blown away. 
Because here you see these people mm -hmm. who are operating at the highest level and they're being the most critical of themselves. They're being the most humble, you know, just the opposite of what you would expect. So talk to me about trust and personal responsibility and why that's so important. How do we cultivate that? Well, you just said it. And the blues are an example of just that, right? are willing to take ownership of those places of that growing edge, or sometimes I like to call it the bloody edge because it is, you know, it's, it's, it often feels painful. The guy next to you is going to call himself. I don't have to point fingers. I don't have to hold you accountable, right? That breeds trust. Cause I know you've got you. And I, that's what I see when I look at that formation. And I, that's what I see when I see the blues debrief is the safety in that room. And they even call it the safety, right? Yep. Um, the safety in that room it, 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 it's 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 unbelievable to me. It's an amazing thing that they've cultivated. And that's what breeds trust is the fact that I know that you are going to take responsibility for everything that you do, everything that you don't do, everything that you say, everything that you don't say. I don't have to get you to own that. And so if we're talking about an individual relationship or we're talking about those macro relationships of uh, you know many relationships within a company, if you're going to breed a culture yeah. of trust, it starts with that. It starts with personal responsibility. Yeah, I love that. And I know in your book, uh, you actually ended on personal responsibility, but you and I both yeah. know that you actually, it's a circle. You really start there, right? And talk talk to us is why did you put that at the end of your five uh, versus the first one? So I came with personal responsibility. I said, it's sort of like stoicism, which is kind of like Buddhism with a mohawk and a few tattoos, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So I was looking for, a push, a nudge, something to to help my clients own their stuff, right? Because it's like the, the tail of the tape for us is how much weight are you going to carry? But no one likes it. It's the jagged little pill, right? And when I start talking about personal responsibility in relationships at any level, people feel like I'm going to ask them to own things they don't want to own. If they, they get defensive, they think I'm going to ask them to be too permissive. And that's actually not what I'm asking. I'm asking them to take the 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 I'm taking the higher ground of emotional intelligence. I'm asking them to take the road less traveled. And that's often a difficult road. Everything inside of us will push against taking responsibility if we're not careful. And so I put it, I say I put it at the end because if I put it at the beginning, no one would have read the book. Um, I put it at the end as sort of like, look, everything, all the other practices that I offer of mindfulness, parts, narrative, and choosing and get into those another time all rest on, are you willing to do those things, right? Are you willing to own all that stuff? Are you willing to carry that weight? And that's a question that I, that I ask. And I say, you know, I, my practice is open to everyone. There's only one toll that you have to pay. You got to want to, you got to want to do it. And the road I ask companies and people in my practice to walk are pretty hard. Yeah, let's dive into that because I think it ties into the who do you want to be and how do you want to show up, right? But you started with mindfulness. I like to use the word awareness. Uh, it's very similar, right? Uh, awareness of yourself, awareness of the, mm -hmm. the external environment of your customer, of your teammates. Um, talk to me more about what do you mean when you use the word mindfulness, I, I'm moving away from mindfulness a little bit too, because it just seems a little played out. People sort of, you know, kind of, oh yeah, mindful. Here we go again. I'm using self-awareness a lot these days, but mindfulness, the 2,500 year old practice of just paying attention on purpose. Now, because we're taking in so much information through the various ports in our body, about 400 billion bits of information per second, the brain wants to go on autopilot. And so that's, that's the nemesis to mindful living, to being self-aware. And so it's a it's a different thing for us to stop, push pause, and to begin to notice what we're thinking, what we're feeling. Now, self awareness, mindfulness is a tool. This is where it gets really fun, right? So mindfulness becomes the ramp. You, I, the thing that drives me crazy about uh, psychology and the different practices that we offer in, in the Western world is it just says, well, just go do that, right? There's no ramp. Mindfulness, that Eastern practice offers us a ramp and the ramp is to be able to stop, push, pause, notice the thing I'm doing that I don't want to do and to be aware of the thing that I now want to onboard. So without self-awareness, 
how are we to 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 bring a bring on board any new practices? How are we to get rid of old habits that we don't like and bring aboard new ones without being self aware? So for me, mindfulness had to be the first practice, had to be. Oh, I love it. I was just thinking from a business context, you know, adapting to change. I mean, the world's changing rapidly right now. Yep. It, it just keeps changing faster, right? And we talk about innovation. We talk about being ahead of the curve. Um, but I was just thinking that that's got to start with number one of this self-awareness. And yep. also, I would like to say situational awareness. You know, in fighter pilots, we call it situational awareness, which is not only yourself, but the environment out there. And uh, there's a famous guy named Boyd. He was a fighter pilot, but he he created what he calls the Udu loop. Have you ever heard of the Udu loop? Have I ever mm -hmm. talked to you about this? No. It's, it's four things: observe, orient, decide, act. And he used it in a in a in an engagement, fighter pilot engagement. Is you know when you're coming in there and you've seen lots of the movies, you know you're you're coming in and and you're seeing your 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 enemy over here, your opposers. And first thing is just observe. You know, what altitude are they are? Where are you? What airspeeds? Because you got to orient. And that's part of the orientation yep. of because sometimes the best answer is go away. You don't want to mm -hmm. engage. You're going to get your butt kicked. Right. So observe, orient, then comes to that decision point. Hey, I'm, I'm going to engage or I'm not. Right. And then the action, you know, is is something that works in business. Or it works in life. But I want to tie it back to what what you were just saying earlier, just how important in a business why these concepts need to be not only talked about, but really understood. Well, because I think people have a vague understanding typically of something like self-awareness or mindfulness. And you really need to have a visceral experience of it. And, you know, it was a great example of when uh, in the movie, when boss was talking to the guys about the first, uh, they were, they were doing the first demo in California. Right. And, and so he's like, look, your attention is going to get pulled to the crowd. And he kept talking to the guys about bringing it back. He didn't use mindfulness or self-awareness, but he was sort of, that, right. And so he was able to help them find their focus. So that's what mindfulness does. It helps you to focus on the things that you need to be focusing on. And so if you're going into a big presentation or a big sale or whatever it is that you're doing, something that you know you have to perform really, really well with that, like the, right. Yep. What am I thinking? What am I feeling? Orienting yourself. And the question I ask is, who are you showing up? And the other one is, what's the story you're telling? Well, let's dive into that because that that's that's your next steps, right? So yep. that's the parts piece, right? Who's showing up and what's yep. the narrative? What's the, the story? Talk to me. What does that mean? So the narrative is just our thoughts, right? And we think, oh, it's just a thought. We're no big deal. We have about 70,000 thoughts on any given day. One or two is not a big deal. They are actually a big deal. Here's why. The brain tells a story that the body, is, meaning when you fires off a thought, your, your body is like a short order cook for all of that. And so it goes, oh, okay, so we're doing this or we're doing that, right? And so it's really important that we curate our narratives, that we focus on what it is we're thinking and we understand it because when we have thoughts, the body fires off feelings, those feelings fire off more thoughts. Now we are in a loop, uh, which I say, it depends often on the part of us that's in play. We can also get there through, through, through a narrative, right? And so looking at our thoughts, this is where we have, we find our, this is where we find our mental resilience right? Is to be able to stop and think about, okay, so what am I thinking? What's the story I'm telling about the situation I'm in? Is it true? Is it real? Um, you know, who, who, who do I think I am in this? Who have I been historically in this? And this is an opportunity for us to actually rewrite personal history, right? Because all those things that happened to us in the past, they're sitting back there, right? And if maybe we didn't fare very well, maybe we, we, we could have done better, Maybe we're telling ourselves a story of of of, uh, of not getting it right. This all can become a self fulfilling prophecy if we don't don't jump on that. And so, in my book, when it comes to relationships, the narrative lives as a cautionary tale, right? The narrative can live as a cautionary tale because catching your thoughts can often feel like catching wind in your hand. Um, but mindfulness allows us to slow down and look at our thought patterns and to begin to reauthor our thoughts so we can bring in mental resilience. Yeah, I know. I, I having worked with you and and done this with other companies, the idea of building the bridge from the individual to the team. There's so many uh, analogies here, right? So you know, I catch myself. 
Like what part am I showing up? Am I pissed off? Am I angry? You know, mm -hmm. um, or is it, you know, you, you show up, like you said earlier, how you got to choose intention, how I want to show up. And uh, that hopefully that's done before, but let's talk about a meeting. So boom, we have a briefing, maybe it's with a client, right? And all of a sudden somebody says something, some, something triggers you. I want to talk about a trigger. And, yeah. and all of a sudden we get into a part that maybe gets is a little upset, gets pissed off, all of a sudden angry. And now we're not making good decisions in that mode, right? So talk to me a little bit about that sequence and why it's important to catch it before it actually germinates. Well, I would go pissed off, angry. What about uh, what about triggering your inner fraud, right? Okay. That part of you that that uh, is scared is is unsure of maybe your skill set, or has been telling a story of like, what am I doing in this room, right? So as an example, because you put me in this position, my friend, right? John invites me to speak at the Vale roundtable conference, Dick Strong's Vail conference, right? Yeah, with his two thumbs up and his big smile, right? And so I get there, you guys, this is the best. I get there and I'm listening to the first round of speakers. And so to set the stage, everyone in the room is a speaker. There's about 30 of us there. The first guy discovered the largest dinosaur in the world is a big TED talker, right? I got John Foley here. I've got another guy who was a, a former Navy SEAL. I've got three doctors. One's doing stem cell research. Uh, on on cardiac patients, the other two have climbed uh, Mount uh, uh, Everest, and one's doing uh, uh, cataract surgery on Sherpas. And here I am, and I finally go over to John about day two of listening to these people talk, and I go, "What am I doing here, John? What did you What did you do? Why would you?" So my inner fraud is just firing on all cylinders, right? It's like, "What am I gonna? How can I?" And so I went back to the hotel that night and uh, and and I had a long talk with myself. So to, to your point, what can you do? Say, like, what the, what's the story I'm telling? I don't believe here. What am I? And the kid from me from the wrong side of the tracks is I grew up really poor to, with a really young mom. Right? So it's like, what am I doing here with all these learned people? And so I sat my parts down and I said, look, the story you're telling is not good. I need, I need my inner professional to show up. I need the part of me that's been to the school, got the letters after them, written the books, been through the stuff. I need that guy to show up. And so that day I showed up and if there was a few people that went before me and I could feel that inner critic come up, that inner fraud in me come up and go, um, you know, you're still that kid, right? And I go, no, no, no. And so in the moment I was like, look, how do you show up here? Who do you want to be? How do you want to talk about this moment, right? And your buddy John has put himself on the line, right? John's, John believes in you. You need to show up. And so I said, I put the big boy pants on and I showed up in my inner my inner professional, the therapist in me, the part of me that loves people and loves to teach and loves to show people what, what possibilities are. And so I stepped out on that stage and I gave what I thought was pretty good talk, right? Yeah, not just you thought, um, everybody did. You got the most questions of anybody uh, because <laughs> you hit a nerve and they could tell you were authentic and you mm. knew what you were talking about. And we all have these challenges. It's the human need, right? Um, you That's don't right. need to be a Nobel prize winner uh, to, to, to give a lesson. Right. And, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I know even Dick said, I want to talk to you off to the side. <laughs> and that's usually the best. Um, so <laughs> that went really well, but really good example of all of us, you know, have mm -hmm. these challenges, right? Uh, the inner fraud, or you're just afraid and, um, mm -hmm. and whatnot. Let's go now to, to we, we, we're missing a piece, right? So we got the mindfulness, we got the parts, parts, we got the narrative. What was fourth? Choosing. Now talk about that. What do you mean yeah. by choosing? Well, choosing for me, like when I look at it, when we're talking about a personal relationship, like a love relationship is like, can I put some of myself aside for this person? Can I make room for their heart within mine? Right. And, but when we're talking about a, a business relationship or we're talking about how we're moving, we have to choose ourselves often because we work so hard in this country, right? We tend to really work really hard. I watch you go and I'm like, how does this man do, how does he do what he does? And so helping my clients find balance, like, and I work with people who are entrepreneurs at the highest level. They are, you know, the, 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 the heart and the soul of their companies and so they work morning, noon, and night. And so helping them find balance. And they come to me and they're, and they're stressed out and they think it's just because of work. I'm like, that's not all of it, right? And so what I do is I help people find their buckets and I help them find their well. 
right? The buckets are the are the areas of your life that need to be filled, and your but and your well is where you go and fill that. And very often when they've put themselves aside and they don't know what their buckets are. Now, for me, as an example, my buckets are mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, professional, right? And some of them overlap, right? Mm-hmm. And so I want to make sure that a mental, emotional person, I want to make sure that I'm taking care of myself mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, personally, professionally. That means like, as an example, I might be working really hard and firing all cil- on all cylinders, but I really spent much time with my kids. And so that's sitting back there. I got two boys that need me and they're, you know, 11 and 15, and I need to show up for them. That's part of my gig. That's part of my job. That's part of my responsibility. It's part of the weight that I decided to carry. And so I have to, if that bucket's not, not close to full, something in, in my psychic energy knows it. That's my stress. I'll say it's, oh, it's, I have so much work. That's not it. It's because I know I need to pay more attention to those kids as an example, or I'm not, maybe I'm not doing enough physically for myself, right? Because I've been sitting here, sitting is the, is the new smoking, right? I sit a lot unless I'm standing like I am now. Um, but uh, if I'm not physically active, that bucket's not getting full and, and I need to pay attention to that. So choosing yourself is knowing your buckets and knowing where it is you need to go to fill that bucket, knowing where your well is, knowing what your wells are. Wow. I love that you hit at a high level of these wells and buckets, right? I mean, um, as I was thinking, and then your definition of stress, that that aligned with me. I Sometimes I get stressed more at home than I do at work because you just defined it is there's something behind me that's that I've committed to that I'm not fulfilling, right? And uh, and so that causes the stress. Where if I'm on the road, man, I'm firing on all cylinders, right? So, and I love that you defined it in different ways. I I, I like to think about I, every morning. I do my glad to be here. Wake up, and part of it is uh, may I be of service to people, but it's also professionally, personally, and spiritually, right? Can I grow? Uh, personally today. By the way, you're helping me right now. Can I grow uh, spiritually today? Again, you're helping me right now. Professionally today. Yeah, you're doing all three in this yep. in this meeting. Uh, but I, I make those conscious choices. So you're talking about the choice because I think that's sometimes a, another spot that I struggle with is when I don't want to make a choice. You know, um, tell me about that. You know, there's an area of the brain that um, actually I can't remember the name of it. And if I said it to you, it would just make me sound smart and people would forget it. Uh, but it's an area of the brain that when you do things that you, quote unquote, don't want to do, it actually gets bigger. And, and high endurance athletes um, who do a lot of things they really want to do. And it's actually bigger in people who live longest, people who are in their hundreds who live, right? That that area of the brain has gotten bigger because they've done things that they didn't want to do. And so they push past uh, those things in life that perhaps um, would have uh, gotten most people, Um, you know, so really choosing yourself is, you know, like it's sometimes choosing those things that you don't really want to do, but you, you should, you know, that you have to. And so that requires also like for me getting into your narrative, right? Like, I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, I gotta, do I have to, I, I have to go work out or do I get to, right? I'm 54 years old. I have a body that works really well. My knees are back's great, right? I need to be grateful. I need to be thankful for that. Gratitude is a choice. Gratitude is a practice for a reason. The brain skews, the brain skews negative, right? Because of the amygdala. And so we start populating a particular narrative in the wrong direction if we're not careful and we won't choose it choose ourselves in the way that we need to or choose ourselves enough um so when i start populating my brain with those narratives about oh i have to go work out or you know or i could just push it to tomorrow i stop i go this is something i want to do this is an opportunity to grow your brain and i have to go la 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 narrative and say i'm not going to listen to that i'm going to i'm going to focus on what i before my body works and i get to go work it well, that I'm so glad you you skewed to the gratitude piece, but uh, I want to talk more about glad to be here. And it's actually more yeah. than gratitude. It is gratitude. It's 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 part of that place. Why is the glad to be here mindset? First off, you know, how do you define it? You've seen me talk about it. You've watched the film, but more importantly, you know it from a psychological. How would you define a glad to be here mindset and why is it so important? 
Well, I mean, first of all, when someone is, I wear those t-shirts around too, and people are like always stopping me and talking to me, what's that mean? And what's that, you know, what's that all about? Right. And, 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 and it is, it's, it's, it's what you, you talk about purpose, passion, presence, gratitude. It's all of those things. And honestly, sometimes it's hard for me because there's so many of those things trigger stuff in my work. I'm like, oh, it's this. And I see all the points. Right. And so there is a real uh, self-awareness within the glad to be here mindset. It's it's taking control of things we often feel like we don't have control over, like our thoughts, right? Like uh, just as as um, passion as an example, right? It, as I said, the body tells a story, or the brain tells a story that the body believes. You said heart and head. You know that's heart and head, right? What what's going on in my body? What's happening in my head? And so. You know, th those four pieces that you offer, I mean, they really do add a nice frame to your day. And I'm always blown away at the way you, and I talk about you in my talks. I'll say, if anyone can can what John Foley can do when he wakes up, go ahead and do it because you're going to make a million. And it has everything to do with like how you start your day as an example. It's how I start my day. The first thing I do when I open my eyes is I ask myself, who do I want to be? How do I want to show up to this family as an example? Right. That's the beginning of the glad to be here uh, uh, practice, really. And deciding how you're going to move into your day, deciding how you're going to live your life. So often we can feel like victims of the wind or, or, or circumstance or the way, you know, the fact that I woke up on the wrong side of the bed. And now I'm going to go downstairs and be sort of terse and truculent. I'm going to start my day that way. We actually have a choice. Are you willing to stop, push, pause, take that breath and make that choice? Right. That for me is the essence of the glad to be here mindset. Man, I love it. I'm glad you started. I'm going to do that on my wake up tomorrow morning is uh, ask myself, you know, who do I want to be and how do I want to show up and right. then get into my gratitude practice, then mm -hmm. get into what am I grateful for present moment, the past and the future. That's that's great. I really like that. Um and don't forget the left foot forward is another technique of how you get out of bed. So you never get out of bed on the wrong side. If you come out with left foot, hit the floor first. And uh, this world is not normal. I hadn't heard that one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a technique. Man, I love that. Okay. Um, hey, we got so much that we could talk about. I want to make sure that we hit some of the, the core attributes of, of what you wanted to get across uh, anything else from the film or from our conversation that you want to make sure that the, the listener really understands? That last point was really critical uh, and you're giving us great examples. So anything else on your plate? Man, I feel like we've hit so many awesome points. Um, you know, we even hit authenticity. We, uh, I, I can't say enough good things about the movie um, and just, just the way those guys show up. It's just, you know, and, I, and I'm filtering it through my frame of, of five practices and and they 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 hit all of them uh beautifully especially that personal responsibility thing you know i, I there's a, a, a someone much smarter than me a long time ago said you know we know we've grown up we know we've taken personal responsibility when it got lost turns into i lost it oh, right nice. and i can never really stress to people enough how powerful that is that when Trouble comes and it will. You can't fill the sandbags during a storm, right? And this practice, the glad to be here mindset, the practices that I offer and the way these things dovetail helps people on a personal and professional level fill those sandbags, tape the windows before the storms because the storms are coming. That's life. We live in this relative world. And so taking responsibility for preparing ourselves early on, uh, like, like I do every day, I get up, I ask myself, you know, who do I want to be? And then I go downstairs, I grab my journal, right? And I maybe read a couple of pages in a book that I got. I bought six books open on my on my, uh, on my my dresser that I'm looking at. You know, six books that are like, you know, thought provoking and inspiring. And then I go for a walk in the woods and I have this long uh, walk where I sit and just sort of get in touch with, with myself and, and what my day is like. And I start mapping that out. All of this is choice. And what it tells us is we have choice. We have a choice in how we show up to every relationship and every situation in our lives. And the fun part is, is you get to be you, right? Like I wake up every day and I didn't always feel this way, to be honest with you. When I got to the essence and authenticity of who I am as a human being, you know, that old, that old adage, like if you threw all your problems into a pile of everybody else's, you'd pull yours out, right? 
That's true for me. I get to be me every day and you get to be you every day. And whoever's watching this and listening to this, you get to be you, that special, authentic version of yourself. And when we get into our authenticity, oh man, are we, we discover the essence of who we are. And so you get to walk in this version of yourself. And there's so much gratitude that gets pulled in for me around that. Um, and, and, you know, again, the glad to be here mindset or the, these five practices or dovetailing them, they help us find that authentic walk in our lives. And I hope everybody gets a chance to, to do just that. I know you have. Well, I love the way you summed it up here. It's amazing on um, how it becomes a positive way just to be yourself, to be authentic and That's always it. learn, grow, give, you know, this idea of, I, I want to learn, I want to grow. I want to give first these kinds of things. But the idea of uh, you just helped me. I always, sometimes I want to read in the mornings, but I got all these thick books and I just don't even open them. I like the idea of laying them open, you know, and just picking up one page. pages. I like that. Yeah. Sometimes I'm just like, I kind of ask, I'm like, you know, give me what I need. And I kind of, uh, boom. And invariably I find some nugget to go on. Yes. And you know, that just sort of seeds the day. I'm like, Oh, like today we'll work, we'll work on non-judgment. There's a challenge. Um, right. <laughs> Yeah, but even if it's just these, like, you know, where where is my gratitude? Where is my purpose? Where is my passion? Where is my presence? Where is my, where, where, who do I want to be? Man, dig into that one for, you know, for a little while and and watch what pops up. It's a, it's a daily practice for me. Um, and so the one thing I would tell people is give yourself the gift of a little bit of time every morning to get yourself centered and to build that foundation. That's huge. Yeah, and, and I love that. Uh, I like putting both a mental and a physical aspect to that. Like you said, you get outside and you walk yep. nature, that all helps. Um, I also was thinking that, uh, you know, this idea of becoming your best self, right? For whatever that is that day, that, that doesn't mean that you're not carrying some burdens, right? But be the best self you can be. That is what helps the team out, right? Because we're none of us are working as a silo. And I think about these jets behind me and I think about the organizations that we talked about is it it was incumbent that I show up with my A game or at least my best self, right? Mm -hmm. And and I knew and I trusted my teammates to do the same, right? That's right. And if they didn't, we had a safe environment. You could say, man, I need to take a break today. Okay. I'm yep. I'm not there. And that's part of that safe environment. Uh, but it becomes magical not only with yourself, but within an organization and a team, when the organization adopts these principles, That's right. when the teams adopt these principles, now the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That's by the way, Gestalt. Uh, where, and uh, and that is what, what really makes, I think, being on the blues magical, but being with you magical, being with all these organizations we get to help, uh, it, it really makes a difference. And I know that's where I get my energy from. So as as we wrap up, how would you like to uh, how would you like to leave everybody on on what thought, or is there any? Here, here, I'll, I'll ask it a, a different way, unless you have the answer to that. No, no, go. Ahead. Okay. Um, are there any mantras? Are there any sayings? Is there anything you already kind of alluded to this already? How you wake up every morning that um, that if you wanted to share with with somebody right now, what would that be? Well, uh, less than a mantra. I mean, because I've, I've sort of the one the one that I've whittled mine down to is like, in every situation, who do I want to be? Mm -hmm. um, and I tell that story. Rob actually likes the story of me on the surfboard when the guy was being confrontational. And my first reaction was to be very protective of myself. And then I asked myself in that nanosecond, who do I want to be? And I asked another aspect of me to show up. And I turned to the guy and I said, essentially, like, you know, I think we're I think we're better than this. I think we need to be better than this. Right. And that's. That's what I like. That's why I like to ask myself that every day, because the best version of myself, the thing I'd like to leave people with is like, might not always be the sweet, saccharine, sweet, you know, like your authentic self may have a, a bit of truth to offer. And so, you know, it's like I read Eckhart Tolle's book and you know me, I love Eckhart Tolle books for sure. But for me, it's not necessarily oh, some of those books like um, The Power of Now, as an example. They're great books, but they're not necessarily a recipe for living in the relative world where people are cutting you off in traffic, right? And so um, the idea of asking yourself at every moment, you cannot ask it enough. 
Who do you want to be? How do you want to show up? How do I want to talk about this moment, this life, two weeks, two months, two years down the line? It sets the frame for you. And then you don't have to apologize for things that you've done and said later. Right? Yeah. And when you walk in that sort of authenticity, you watch what, watch how people notice. Mm. Right? That's how you, for me, that's how you create awe. Right? On a micro level, it turns into a macro. Right? They, they, they're they looking at you and going, wow, something about that guy. Right? Yeah. Walk in your authenticity. Love Find it. it. Man, that was powerful. It reminds me of Gandhi. Be the change you want to see in the world, right? So yeah. there you go. Right. You, you and Gandhi are are, are, are together. I hey, love the Mahatma. Last question. Why are you glad to be here today? Oh, right? You know, honestly, it's uh, uh, I get to work with you and I get to work with Rob and Stephanie. And it's like, you know, I've been a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, a, a solo artist for a while. And now I feel like I'm a part of a band. And, you know, I've been with you, hanging around you guys a little bit for a while. And so for me, um, you know, I was a goalie in hockey. That's sort of a, it's, it's like being a kicker uh, or a quarterback. You know, you're, you're sort of on your own. You're a part of the team, but you're kind of on your own. And so this, this feels good. So I'm glad, I feel glad to be here with you guys uh, and the glad to be here team. It's just, it's really something to, to be welcomed in the way I've been welcomed in. Uh, and so I'm just so thankful. And I, I, I got to mention sugar as well. Yeah. I just want everybody to know that you and I are working together. If they, if they want you speaking and how to connect this, just reach out to John Foley Inc. But also, how can they get a hold of you for some mm -hmm. personal elements? How do you like to communicate? Uh, right now, I'm on Instagram a lot. So I'm at uh, Lair Torrent Holistic Therapist on Instagram, obviously doing a lot of uh, reels and uh, you know, talking with people on, on Instagram. People can go to my website at lairtorrent.com and the book's available wherever finer books are sold. What's the title of the book? The Practice of Love, right? The Practice of Love. That's correct. Yeah. But with what the things that people have been saying about it is while it's a, a relationship, but it's a book geared towards romantic relationships, people are really pulling from it a lot of uh, stuff that they can take out into their personal and professional lives. But that's the next book that's coming. That's right. And I've already, I've, I'm, I'm reading your book. I've, I've put it to work. It's, it's great, everybody. It, and it's much more than a romantic relationship, but it works on romantic too. So that's, 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 good. Uh, that's but, good. But it works in every aspect of your life and we can't wait to get to your, your new book. So, Hey everyone, uh, really appreciated this thoughts, you know, Lair, I'm thinking we got to do this again. You know, we talked about balance and what does that really mean? But we didn't talk about it. We're going to talk about that deeper. And I also want to know, uh, anybody else, any comments, what did you really like? And, uh, we'll be picking this up again with that Lair, Glad to be here, buddy. Glad to be here, John. Thank you so much.